I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Steve Firth to discuss his paper on the right to posthumous bodily integrity of ETI biologics. Steve has a bachelor's and master's in philosophy from the University of Lethbridge, and for the last six years has been a PhD candidate in philosophy through the University of Helsinki. Steve's work includes research into practical applications of the picture theory of disability, experience teaching philosophy, logic, and research methodologies at the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology as part of the core education program, and volunteer work as an awareness advocate for cancer screening and early detection. So Steve, welcome back. When you sent this one to me, I immediately thought of David Grush, who has testified that the U.S. government or its contractors are in possession of both ET spacecraft and the biological remains of pilots. So I want to get into this paper. This is really exciting, big picture stuff. And I think this is very important ethical and philosophical work as well. What would you say makes this new paper on ethics timely or even perhaps long past due? Um, well, uh, thanks for asking me back onto the uh, the the show. Firstly, Tim, thank you. Um, what what makes it timely? Well, uh, that's a very good question, and and, and I think uh, you're wise to bring up the the testimony to Congress. Uh, it's certainly clear that there are moves to talk about this sort of activity more readily now, uh, where once things were perhaps. I don't know, shuffled under the rug. Uh, they're they're more openly discussed now. I, I, that's evinced by NASA's recent press release on uh, aliens and alien technologies and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, but I think really the discussion has sort of been about since before we had the capacity to interact with space very much. And so the philosophical question really, I suppose, has always existed. Um, and that's that can largely be boiled down to work really conducted in philosophy and ethics on the nature of of responsibility and autonomy and the kinds of moral respects that is due to entities in the world. And just recently, a couple of years ago, the big mountain in in New Zealand, for instance, has now been um, designated as sort of a person so that they can't. Uh, you know, the, there's a certain kind of respect that's due towards it from from the rest of us. And I mean, it's a bit of an odd sort of thing for us to to, to say, because obviously mountains aren't persons, but but there's a need to protect um, protect an entity. And so the, the way that we do that is to talk about this sort of responsibility and this sort of discussion. So um, it's only it's only natural, I think, that we when we start thinking about space, and other entities within space and in space uh, that we consider the kinds of obligations that we, uh, you know, the kinds of, not necessarily obligations, but the kind of respect that's due, what kind of entities are there and what does that mean for our relationships? How do we, you know, how, do, how does it guide our relationships uh, when we f first have them or when we develop them? And, and so far as I'm aware, there's very little real philosophical work done on this area because it's generally considered the the uh, bailiwick of science fiction and other sorts of things. You know, it's it's, it's well, considered a bit spacey. It, you know, Steve, if I could jump in, I'm going to go off my questions list for for just a moment. But um, one of the things that I like about this paper is you're really kind of cutting into this area of uh, increasing intelligence, right? And I think that is one of, for me at least, that is kind of one of the big surprise areas of the 21st century. Uh, you know, in the past, we have recognized, you know, human beings as intelligent, right? And then everything else we've just kind of said well maybe you know we'll, we'll get there when we get there but uh like octopus for instance we're starting to realize that they are more intelligent than we thought they were and they have a very different type of intelligence right in the case of the octopus i just read that their nervous system is actually spread throughout their tentacles as well as in their brain so it's completely different than human beings uh, we're also recognizing that even dogs and cats are more intelligent in many ways than we've wanted to admit in the past, right? So that's another aspect of it. Uh, we have artificial intelligence, right, which is 
encroaching on human level intelligence and may be considered another form of sentient life in the next few decades. And now we're looking at ET as well. So uh, there are lots of different types of intelligence that are being recognized and emerging. And what you're talking about goes to not only the respect and dignity, but also how we identify that intelligence and how we characterize it. You know, all of this stuff goes together. So it's it's exciting. It's a big picture thing. You're talking about ET biologics, right? Like uh, crash recovery stuff. But again, this bigger picture goes to, uh, you know, humanity is not alone. And I think that we're starting to recognize that and really internalize it. Absolutely. I mean, when when we originally started this taxonomy process by which we sought to understand the world around us and, and, and the things in it, um, there were clearly human-like things which had that kind of intelligence and then everything else. And, and I think that's probably done uh, because humans sort of like to elevate themselves, certainly in that intellectual capacity. And, and it is clear that we are like quite a lot different than all other entities in terms of our capacity for cognitive thought. Um, but over the last sort of 50 years, it has become evident that there are, there are levels and nuances in which yeah. intelligence is not necessarily an easy category to define you know i mean once upon a time in the 60s and 70s we used this iq test as some sort of a demo you know demonstration of a, a human's intellectual capacity and now we recognize that uh actually that's you know it's it's one mechanism of identifying certain inte intellectual parameters but it's it doesn't really carefully define them all and is not very good at defining the ones that it does define so there are issues with with our taxonomy of intelligence I, I would go to say and so the philosophy the philosophy that's behind that has sort of it's always pushing the boundaries this is what philosophy does is push the boundaries of knowledge to understand new knowledge and, and sort of direct new thinking um which is perhaps our, our greatest contribution to the world but uh in that sense what is what is happening is that we've uh we've identified potential ways in which intelligence is not just a matter of being able to crunch numbers or to you know draw yeah. art or to do other things i mean as you quite rightly pointed out the new ai technologies are, are extremely gifted in doing art and and from what i from what i discover on tiktok quite good at replicating johnny cash's voice as well but um so now we have a, a scenario where we have these human designed structures and entities which are approximating human like um i'm not going to say sentience but human like capacities for for uh novel uh, neoteric creations which perhaps we have thought in the past to be like the the bailiwick of humans and and, and that's what distinguishes from other things so when we start making this taxonomy and by and by that i mean you know the way the way that we decide decide what is intelligent what is not intelligent we we realize that the 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 little gray zones are actually quite a lot broader than we thought they are and it is absolutely without doubt that were there any etty um and i don't mean to make the tautology by the were there any extraterrestrial entities um that are able to to come to our planet or to send probes or to communicate they are by by necessity intellectual or capable of that sort of level of contact and therefore we need to recognize them not as not as sort of objects of curiosity although that too but also recognize that when when we identify that on our planet we i we accord them with some sort of moral respect and what we say is you know dolphins have moral respect because they do the dolphin things and dogs have moral respect and cats have moral respect and horses have moral respect and people like peter singer and and the the article you've probably just read uh, argue the same thing for octopus um octopodes and uh, and other sorts of entities of that order and we have categorized them such so that that we know how to have this you know what sort of relationship yeah. we have with them 
And that has not seemed to have been something that's been discussed in regard to Eddie. What happens is that people automatically go towards the, well, are they dangerous? Are they going to destroy us? Can we learn anything from them? Are they fourth dimensional? Are they here already? You know, there's all these kinds of discussions. And very few of them, if any, actually discuss, you know, what are our moral obligations to these entities? Like, how do we respond to them? To what sort of moral status are they uh, deserved? And I think that is a very important question that needs answering and preferably before we have, you know, absolute confirmation that they exist. Yeah. So let's get into posthumous bodily integrity. It's a rather obscure term. So I want to clarify for the audience that what you're talking about basically is the treatment and handling of dead aliens, which may or may not be biological, may or may not be truly dead. And in the case of time travel, they could be our descendants or for dimensional travel, they could be literally another version of ourselves. So what qualifies here as a dead ETI, I guess? They're they're on the ground and not moving. Could we call it that? Uh, that's, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, one of the significant issues that we're going to face uh, is identifying um, whether or not something is deceased. Uh, and I and I mentioned this because there are a number of entities on this planet, a number of creatures, tardigrades, and other such things that can actually go into hibernation for an awfully long time. And and if you yeah. poke them, they, they don't sort of come back to life. They can, uh, there's a frog, I think, that can overwinter, uh, for instance. It can literally freeze solid uh, and dethaw and, and crack on about its life. Uh, so the existence of these quite obscure and, and what we might call abnormal in the sense that they don't occur very often Um entities uh, they exist here and so there's no reason to presume that they don't exist elsewhere either so one might argue that some such eti have the capacity for some i don't know um, broad scale uh, uh repair system you know biological or or uh i don't know what do they call those little things in the blood that data has like uh, nano nanobots yeah, yeah yeah so they might have some nanotechnology that reconstructs things and they might go into a, some sort of a stupor for for months or years and, yeah. and while they do that I, we don't know this, this is all speculation um so the question as to how do we know they're dead or not is an extremely good one um and based upon the fact that we don't know enough about alien architecture, be it biological or post-biological. Um, that is one of the arguments that I make that we should perhaps not go slicing and dicing them up before, before yeah. we are sure. Well, um, and again, if I, I'm going to go off my questions list yeah, here, yeah, but, on, yeah. you know, I, I think that this is another, uh, you know, a emerging and changing area in the 21st century is our, our, our definite definition of death, right? And, uh, you know, in the past, it was if the heart stops, that's it. Yeah. And then it was the heart and brain activity, brain activity is stopped. And that's it, you know, and what we're seeing over the last few decades is medical science keeps pushing those boundaries further and further back. And then we have other technologies as well, like, for instance, cryopreservation, is looking at potentially reviving people. Now, they can't do that now. They won't be able to do that for several decades, perhaps centuries. But um, it, it's interesting. Some of the things like ice crystals that the dot would prevent that forever. You know, these ice crystals damage cells in the body and that's it. You can't bring people back. That's not an issue. So, so even in the case of long-term cessation of biological function, it appears that we will at some point be able to revive, quote unquote, dead people, right? And so going to the ET example, if you're dealing with things that are thousands, millions of years more advanced than us, they may not be dead. And it, like you said, we probably don't want to be slicing and dicing if we're not sure. Well, there, yes. I, I mean, all of all of what you said is is relevant. Um but I'm I'm mindful of the fact that there's good reason to believe, as you you sort of alluded, that that eti are not likely to be necessarily biological. And one yeah. of the difficulties we're going to have with post biological life is 
it, uh, we we know sufficiently little about it that we like what what really constitutes a ongoing organized structure is not clear so to what extent some post biological entity might be able to repair itself is is unknown and at this point unknowable um it, it would be very difficult when faced with some post biological etty uh to to look at that thing and say well it, it it's it doesn't seem to be doing anything at the moment it must be dead but that's a, that's an awfully large leap to make um yeah. there's no reason to like there's a there's a lot of stages in that process before one gets to death or i don't know whatever the death equivalent of a post biological entity might be um that that we should rule out before before making even that final conclusion um and i think part of the difficulty is that there's been there's been no philosophical work done on what constitutes uh sufficient level of death for something that's foreign to the planet uh, it's there are some sociological uh, i have a colleague that works in this area there are some sociological difficulties with the definition of death there are some um conflicts between the sociological folk concepts mm. for want of a better description the medical concepts by which we understand the cessation of life and and you can't really apply those to post biological entities because you know you could sort of it is i i don't know enough about computer technology but i would imagine that some sufficiently gifted computer technologyist might be able to take old like old floppy drive disk data and uh, that has, has been corrupted and then sort of get some sort of life back out of it or an old computer and reboot it and make it do something uh which suggests that you know you, there's a quite a lot possibility of a fairly lengthy dormant time for a yeah. post biological entity that maybe runs on on binary ones and zeros or whatever it is they run on um to be able to reboot or repair itself you know and it would be it would be too quick i think and i'm i'm certainly not assuming that nasa or whomever is involved with the discovery of these biologics is um it's going to make the stupid mistake of trying to cut open something before they've proved that it's non-functional but i do suspect knowing how these things work from the inside a little bit that there is a big hurry to discover more to protect ourselves as we've discussed in previous interviews because of the hobbesian trap than there is to actually uh know more about the entity first if that makes sense well i want to get into the alien autopsy this was a 17 minute black and white film that was supposedly depicting a secret medical examination or an autopsy of an alien by the united states military back in 1947 so the film itself is widely regarded to be a hoax, but it gives us a great example to work with. Uh, you know, as an aside, I saw Alien Autopsy, I think, on TV. I believe it was uh, uh, Jonathan Frakes from Star Trek was the announcer for it in the 1990s. And when it first came out, they were they didn't portray it as being a hoax. They portrayed it as being unknown. And I believe later there was just this uh mountain of evidence that eventually emerged that made it seem like a hoax well we'll describe it that way so it's widely widely believed to be a hoax but it was very interesting and i think that this is a great case example to work with whether or not it's real um now what are your thoughts on that alien autopsy film have you seen that uh i remember watching it when it came out um yeah like you, I, I remember Jonathan Frakes, uh, and I, I think it was a F Fox television thing, but um, I, I might be wrong. I have a feeling that it was a British producer or something that was involved in it. Uh, but That's, anyway. Yeah, what what I remember from it, and again, I'm, I'm kind of shooting from the hip, but when I was doing research, I it kind of started to come back to me. Mm. Um, it, again, it, it was when it came out, they had nothing to indicate you know that it was it was fake but then later there were questions about the film stock and then you started to have people who were coming forward and saying um you know yes we worked on this and 
no, it's it's never been proven that it was a hoax, but I I believe it's it's widely regarded now. And well, I I yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm going to ignore the 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 legitimacy of the film um, because I think. Uh, I, I think there's a sufficient amount of evidence to demonstrate that it's definitely not true. Um, uh, the minimum of which is that, and I've mentioned this in the previous article, the likelihood of a humanoid sort of formed entity arriving uh, evolutionarily on some other planet is minuscule. Uh, it, yeah. it's, it's It's almost non-existent. That our pattern, you know, the bipedal sort of thing, uh, does exist is is demonstrative because here we are. Um, so, so, so that it is on file in the galaxy is is absolute. Um, but there's there's almost no reason to believe that that it would be replicated elsewhere. Um, so, in in just in virtue of the fact that it demonstrates a bipedal humanoid like life form, one could on probability rule that right out as being legitimate. But re regardless of the film itself, which is <laughs> debatable in in many terms, uh, the biggest issue is the is the portrayal. From what I'm led to believe, the producer had a conversation in 2006 or an interview or something like that. I seem to recall watching in 2006 that demonstrated that he had reproduced uh, film stock that was missing from the quote unquote original film stock that this. Uh, chap wanted to sell him in I don't know some some place in backwater America, which is equally unlikely. But even were that the case, um, one then wonders about why such an autopsy would have been undertaken in such a. I mean, I know it was 1947, but the room it's like an office room. Somebody just shoved a steel trolley in a in a in a white office room and and. No lights, no surgeries, no. I mean, we had computers and color television, colored film at the time. Why? Why it wasn't recorded in film? Why it was all out of focus and blurred by a seemingly reputable filmographer that was flown in specially? I mean, you you don't choose a guy to film the only alien autopsy on the planet um, who can't focus a camera. <laughs> it's ignoring all of that. The better question is whether those kinds of activities are the kinds of activities that would be uh, conducted were uh, alien biologics to be discovered. Now, assuming that um, assuming that the testimony to Congress of these chaps was legitimate, I don't think it is, but let's assume that it was, that suggests that we have these, that there exist on the planet some biologics. I don't believe there are, he says, underlining my position. But let's assume for the case of argument that there are. The, the question now is, what do we owe that creature? What do we owe that entity? Is it, is it appropriate for us to advance our scientific knowledge uh, by slicing and dicing and discovering and, and all of that kind of stuff? Or should we recognize that those kinds of behavioral practices are responsible for situations that that have transpired in the in the past and have worked out very badly and i i believe the latter obviously i i, I think that that's not but it, what's very interesting is that i was at an ethics conference in august and this discussion was going through my mind and so i took a very sporadic survey of of awfully intelligent people uh at a at a a very busy ethics conference uh, on bioethics and ethics about what should our responsibilities to such entities be. And the consensus of opinion was uh, uh, about 75, 25, that we should, uh, we should uh, protect um, the entity, which was reassuring. What was worrying was that the 25% of the very intellectual people thought it was appropriate to go cutting up um, uh, some sort of alien biologics well, and it, what i worry about is that if these people happen to be the people that are spoken to by the people who are thinking about cutting up a, an alien biologics 
uh, they're going to get the wrong answer and that's going to lead them into a, a situation that I don't think would be good. So the point of this paper is not to say that I've figured the answer out. The point of this paper is sort of cautionary to say, you know, this is a philosophical problem. We sort of need to start engaging yes. it. This is my thoughts on the matter. There may be some other thoughts on the matter. Please give me them. Uh, and uh, we should consider a structure of what we owe to not just alien uh, Etty, but also to, to you know, the the sovereignty and the protection of other planets and asteroids and things like that. I mean, this is a subordinate issue. What kind of responsibilities do we have to maintain their their um, integrity? Are, are we free to go blowing up asteroids to to pillage them for precious metals and other stuff? Or should we let them carry on? Is that, you know, are we, if we decide at some stage to settle a planet, is it an appropriate um, activity to do that for a start? And are we permitted to colonize in that way? I mean, there are many ethical concerns over the colonizations that have occurred in the last three or four or 500 years. Yeah. Um, so it's a bigger picture, but the paper is really to start the ball rolling. No, and I think it's wonderful that you've written this. And I, this is a wonderful topic to discuss as well. Again, not just because of, you know, the prospect of ET life, but, you know, merging intelligence here on Earth. And in terms of the alien autopsy film, that was a black and white film, which I think is really fitting because in that era at that time, these were black and white issues, right? These were, you know, they, they were sharply contoured. You know, you, it's a dead alien. It's on the table. We want to learn what's going on, you know, and, um, you know, now we're looking at this saying, is it truly dead? Can it be brought back to life? You know, um, so th that's one aspect of it. Another aspect that occurred to me when I was researching the questions was, you could think of this as the equivalent of some kind of alien or ET astronaut, right? That's how I would envision yeah. these as, you know, now in today's world, I don't think that we would send any astronaut to another planet without comprehensive video recording equipment. So one of the ideas is that the government is going to squirrel away the body and cut it up in a little lab and no one will ever know. And maybe ET may ask, you know, where's, where's the body? Oh, well, we have no idea. But in reality, it would seem to me that if this is a species that's thousands or millions of years more advanced than us, it's likely that their crew members or their teammates or their entire species would be watching this alien autopsy live through recording equipment that people in 1947 had no idea about. So another aspect of it is, um, you know, this alien autopsy was, was thought to be this uh, secret dissection, but how would they feel if they knew that this was something that ET would probably be very well aware of, possibly even watching in real time. So the the I mean the question you raise is uh, is a compound one because what you're sort of ask you're asking two things. Firstly, do I think that there would be some sort of uh, comparative to our recording equipment um, that Etty have in virtue of visiting other worlds? And the second question is. Is it appropriate uh, for us to de deny some f fact of the matter yeah. when, uh, when or if uh, it came to the question being asked? The first question, I, I, I have no idea. Uh, and the reason I say that is because you are right that we do that. Um, but to maintain that that would therefore be something that Etty does is, is a, is a, a, a and into like a a move that I don't think we can. It's not a logical move that we can make with a, a surety. Can we assume that there would be some sort of monitoring of the of the um, exploration? Yes, I I would imagine that uh, Etty that are seeking to explore the galaxy would have multiple mechanisms of data recording you know sensors and we, we see on star trek don't we the we take a lot of sensor recording sort of automatically as soon as we arrive in orbit just to determine basic parameters of the world and i can't imagine that 
an advantage to Etty would be any different. Uh, however, I have no knowledge of whether that would be the case or not. It would be odd f for me to imagine some sort of post-biological Etty that didn't have any kind of internal monitoring system that would determine the yeah. health or perpetuation of such an entity. And I would be surprised if uh, we let any, if there was an Etty that would be let off any type of spaceship that was not somehow, not necessarily tethered, but, you know, like the life signs of such a creature would not be monitored. Uh, that's something we would do. And I would, it seems logical that other people would do it. But there are a number of intuitions there that I don't think we can make absolutely. Um, the the second question is is more interesting, I think, uh, because it speaks again to the responsibilities that that we have to to some entity that that is discovered on our planet, perhaps by accident or intentionally, you know. And the funny thing about a a, a dead thing is that we on earth have appropriated a certain kind of kind of um respect to that to that thing whether it be a fallen pet or a, you know a dead a deceased pet or a deceased loved one we even mourn the loss of our cars from time to times because we have these emotional connections to them um but the emotional connection is not the same as a moral responsibility and so we don't necessarily have a moral responsibility to our dog um, because dead things don't, the, the wants and needs of a dead thing don't persist once they're dead. Um, but we do tend to think that we have some moral responsibility to our own deceased people. And the reason for that is complex, uh, not necessarily legal and often social or cultural or religious. And in the existence of those sort of pressures to behave in a certain kind of way um we respect the fact that there are preferences of the individual while they're alive there are preferences of that individual by other individuals when they're dead there are religious dogmatic preferences yeah. that are perpetuated and so on and so forth and the reality is that we actually have no concept of what etty would or wouldn't do this to me suggests that if you know if you if you don't know anything about anything you should not interfere well um, and if i could jump in that yeah that's the big takeaway of your paper is that lacking all of this knowledge in all of these different areas uh what you're saying essentially is we should do nothing right like and, and well, in terms I, I of think... invasive stuff, I'm not suggesting. Look, there's an extremely <clears throat> good argument from those people that believe that Etty are going to be violent and aggressive, um, and even scientists that there's a tremendous amount of knowledge to be discovered from from the greater un biological or post biological understanding of the entity itself, the scientific investigation of it. Absolutely, yeah. Am I suggesting that no such intervention should be obtained? No, that's not what I'm claiming at all. What I'm saying is we don't know whether the biological or post-biological remains of an Etty are valuable to their the other Etty. And what yeah. we should do is do nothing invasive. That means that everything else is on the table. Uh, and so my argument here, and I, I th I'm sure you'll probably get to this, is that there exists a system called um, uh, vertopsy, which is a series of complicated um, scans, uh, very, uh, very complex, very convoluted, very data rich scans that could be produced on multiple scanning tools, MRIs and well think of the scanning equipment we have for, for current use um for live people we can use all of those tools because all of those tools are hopefully non-invasive we would might need to reconsider on a post-biological entity because we don't have, uh, the nature of such an entity is unknown and i i don't imagine that it might be a wise idea to shove a post post-biological entity into an mri it might pull it apart well um, it, it, so it, there are certain restrictions, but that what I'm saying is there are a number of things that can be done to retrieve lots of scientific data 
that are non-invasive and perfectly safe. Yeah. And this, this, again, you're, you're touching on, there are so many big questions here it, when you talk about post-biological Eddie. So again, going back to our alien autopsy thing, what you're saying is nothing invasive, right? Which makes complete yeah. sense, you know? And in an earlier interview, one of the things that you'd said was, you know, when their, when their crew comes back to pick them up, we want to be able to very gently say, okay, here is, you know, here is your, your deceased counterpart exactly as we found them we have not done anything now maybe we scan them right when you get into post biological eddie that's interesting because you also get into the ship itself right which may be sentient which may be conscious and that's something that i've wondered about with uh the tic tac right there's a, there's a part of me that was wondered Perhaps those are probes. If they're probes, then the Tic Tac itself may be sentient. And so, again, this goes to to us not knowing where we think, okay, um, you know, maybe we don't have a body, but maybe we have wreckage. Let's take that wreckage apart and see how it works. Maybe it's not wreckage. Maybe that is the eddy. Yeah, look, I mean, these are these are excellent questions, and this is why this paper, which might seem a little left field and 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 I'm sure a lot of your listeners uh, will understand the need for it, but some of your listeners might be going, this guy's a bit crazy. Why is he talking about this sort of stuff? And the reason I'm talking about this sort of stuff is because nobody has done the thinking about what if regarding yeah. this matter, right? So and, and the framework, the framework right. for how to approach it, right? Absolutely, Which... right. There's a, there needs to be a protocol. There needs to be a protocol of, of first contact, which extends to what seems to be non-active protein like first contact right some as you mentioned there might be a, a a vessel of some sort which has crashed or arrived on the planet and appears now to be not doing anything um and the the the, the protocol needs to describe what one does when one discovers this thing do you do you like poke it with a sharp stick or do you like, do you scan it somehow? Or do you like, do you disassemble it? Or like, what do you do with that thing? Do you treat it as a, th a thing? I mean, like one of my earlier papers identifies the fact that it's not going to be clear at all whether something's constructed or not. We, we know that something's constructed because we construct things and we understand the way in which we construct things. But if you took a silicon chip and looked at it, it's not clear that that's constructed. Like yeah. you would have to understand what it is that we're doing with a silicon chip to understand the function of a silicon chip. And it's only when you start pulling it apart and disassembling it that you have any comprehension of what it actually functions like or why. Um, and it may very well be the same case with some Etty uh, thing. You know, I mean, it might not be clear at all why it's landed. There might be, for instance, some kind of Etty whose natural life process is to be ejected from its host planet's surface to meander around the universe for millennia until it gets drawn into uh, the atmosphere of a, a, a suitable planet, uh, which it crash lands and and grows or re revives itself or whatever, you know, just as a like a, a galactic spore rather than some sort of a, you know, I mean, all of these things are hypothetical. They're all subject subjective, but um the the point i'm trying to stay, say here is that we need to, to have a a, a, a toolkit that we follow when we approach these things that tells us how not to bugger stuff up like it's quite easy to have a tool list or a, a protocol that tells you how to proceed to i don't know to be to find the maximum amount of scientific data out that or to there might be one that protects the the people that go and investigate this the maximum safety for the people investigating these things are easy to identify what's very hard to identify because there's so many unknowns is how do we protect the entity how do we know what kinds of procedures are damaging let me give you an example let's assume hypothetically that in 2000 years time we have sent a survey ship to a distant planet um, that is habitable and has some trees on it or some such life thing. And we send them down to the planet and then we take a sample of something 
or we take some equipment there and we we I don't know we take a photograph of it or we scan it in some way and the process of scanning that thing is damaging to the to the entity that would be very similar to there being an etty on that planet that discovers perhaps one of our fallen comrades shoves it in a, a nuclear resonance thing that zaps it with high gamma radiation to reveal its i don't know yeah subatomic spin factors of each of the atoms involved in it but it destroys the sample but it didn't know that because that's a standard tool used on its planet to investigate and their sorts of stuff so we need to recognize somehow uh what kinds of things might be damaging and what kinds of things may or may not be sentient and the reason that the sentience is involved is because as soon as something becomes sentient then we associate that with autonomy and pain and suffering and all of these sorts of things and we're morally obligated not to bring about suffering or pain and we're morally obligated to respond to that sentience in an appropriate way uh, and if we don't i mean we can just assume that something's sentient because it will I don't know that we can, but if we have a walking and moving object, the first thing we should do is assume that there's some sort of sentience about it and then wonder later how to react to it. We can't assume that it's not sentient and cut it up because we need to have more data about it. That would be wrong. Yeah. Well, I, I, I like the idea of non-invasive scanning. And again, I want to go back to this recording idea of it. Um, you know, I did an interview on Neuralink uh, a couple of weeks ago, and the the gentleman I was speaking with had talked about shared consciousness and uh, basically consciousness pro you know consciousness processes moving between the brain and and centralized resources. And so I think the more advanced species become, the more you're going to see that. And again, this this goes to the idea of um, it's. It's possible, perhaps even likely, that they will at least know what's going on. They may even, you know, be participating in it. And so this idea, this this very old school idea of we're going to take it in a back room and cut it apart and see how it works. Number one, we're probably not going to learn very much. And, and number two, um, you know, there is no back room, right? And to me, this would be the equivalent of uh, if NASA sends astronauts to another planet, it's one thing, and I'm not saying it's good, but it's one thing for your astronaut to get eaten by a monster, right? It's another thing to have that live cast from mission control to the entire planet. And, you know, so again, this this is slightly different than the moral aspect of it. Morally, you don't want that astronaut to be harmed in any way. But then there's another aspect of it in terms of you don't want to start an interstellar war through your actions, even on the deceased, right? Well, I I like this example of, of being eaten by some sort of, um, you know, entity on the planet. Let, let's say that we did have this sort of situation. And in the process of our own exploration, we'd um, we'd discovered this planet which had some unusual life that that uh perhaps because it was it needed sustenance it ate us maybe not even intelligent life yeah now that's one thing that's a sort of a that's a sort of a death by exploration and and we kind of on earth we kind of lord that you know <laughs> i don't mean in a in a in a disheartened sort of way but when an explorer goes off and sadly dies in the in the process of their great exploration adventure, we sort of say, yay, he was doing the very best he could to explore and push the boundaries of human knowledge. Da, da, da. Now, that's very different to if uh, that human was captured by some extraterrestrial intelligence, um, experimented on live, uh, yeah. and, uh, you know, during the our human's uh, experiential process, um, you know, the the alien, I don't know, did awful things to its physiology to try and determine. We have this now. We like if you if you read these nonsense reports that appear from time to time on uh, magazines of ill repute, National Enquirer and whatever, uh, where we had it maybe 20 years ago where the cows had their um, 
part of their bodies pulled apart by a big lasery thing, and all of a sudden this was alien investigations into ca- like why would aliens be interested in pulling a cow apart? Anyway, the horror there is is not in the fact that there's experimentation done, although that's that is bad. The horror is that always seems to be done while the patient's alive in order to determine unreasonable sort of information about us and then maybe even the human sample is returned to earth to 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 go about you know having endured massive amounts of pain in these science fiction articles the horror the thing that makes that a science fiction horror is the fact that these experimentations are done and we recognize the moral impropriety there like it's that's where the horror is it's not that the the person returned to earth perhaps a little psychologically damaged but otherwise intact the horror is in the fact that it's done without that guy's autonomy, without that person's permission. And yet here we are saying, oh, yes, we must do this for national security. We must know all that we can know about these things. And in the same like in the same breath, we are abjectly mortified when we are demonstrating, when we're shown sort of um, non-existent and hypothetical, well, existent, but high, but unrealistic and improper suggestions that alien yeah. abductions happen all the time. It's not the abduction well, we care about. It's the fact that we're being experimented on. This I, is the same, I I suspect, I don't know, but we could assume that it would be the same for aliens if we sent back an alien in bits. Yes, I'm sorry, here's your fallen comrade. With Yeah. And and I, I actually, I want to touch on something that you just talked about. When you mentioned cattle mutilations, right, or experimentation on people. So there are anecdotal stories about, you know, ET experiments on people, which may or may not be verified or valid. Um, there are anecdotal reports. I mean, something has been mutilating cattle, right? And and the, then the question becomes what? What's interesting about that is this framework that you're talking about, maybe this should work both ways. We'd be able to lay down a framework and say, okay, these are, these are the rights of any entity, right? Of, of any sort of intelligence on earth or extraterrestrial. And, you know, here's what we expect as, as the human species for the life on our planet. And we will respect that for your life as well. One of the difficulties, and this is, uh, so one of the, let me, one of the difficulties that occurs with this kind of um, uh, position is that on earth, we do actually conduct autopsies. So when, so when a, somebody dies in a tragic accident or when they're, uh, they're thought to be murdered or hurt or something like that, we do actually perform autopsies. Um, and it is one of the only occasions in which we are able to supersede or overrule the preferences of the individual themselves or the family. So an individual can say that they want something done with their body and and it will almost always be followed unless, uh, you know, there's a suspicious death or something like that. And so the, the argument here goes that the benefit to society or... Uh, yeah the benefit to the society is greater if we're capable if we're permitted to to perform the autopsy in order to discover the perpetrator of the the murder or in order to um secure the cause of death in perhaps uh, worries of an outbreak of some pandemic or something um to to ensure the safety of other people now one yeah. of the arguments that is regularly made here is that we ought to know all we can know about an alien, an extraterrestrial intelligence or an extraterrestrial entity, um, because doing so would safeguard our species. This would be the only argument for, uh, you know, a sort of invasive scientific uh, autopsy-like um, uh, work on, on, on such a biologic the downside with that argument is that it presumes that the information that we will reveal from the said autopsy is sufficient to somehow empower us to to gain upper ground with the eti- in terms of some unagreeable disagreeable kind of interaction um which would probably likely obtain if we sent back cut up bits of their own body but so it's not clear to me that that would happen. 
because what are you going to learn from an autopsy? I mean, there's a tremendous amount of scientific experimentation that could be conducted on a on a biological or post biological etty. I mean, it, it's almost endless. You know, you could subject that thing to any amount of scientific testing or evaluation or scanning or like you could do anything with it and you determine quite a lot of information but how much of that information is going to to help us know strategically in terms of any kind of militaristic response some kind of mechanism of i don't know let's put it in basic terms fighting back and the answer is none there's nothing you're going to determine from that thing other than you know what kind of uh, squishy matter it's made from uh, that would allow us to determine how to create weapons that would work in space. Nothing. Yeah. Like none. None of this thing is going to help you at all. It will add to our scientific knowledge and biological knowledge about astrobiology, uh, astro uh, biology by by necessity. But the damage potential is is greater. You've mentioned this before. Yes. I said it last time we spoke. If you send back bits of a of a, a biologics in bag, I'm sorry for your fallen member. This is this or lie. These are not going to be well received um, actions uh, by an ethi because I would imagine that trust and truthfulness would be. I mean, we don't know this for sure. Perhaps that is a lying entity, but um, we would imagine that it would be trustworthiness would be re re relevant to its social development. So it would be understood as being practical and useful and, and necessary, and it would value that. And so, if we send back bits of an etty, that would not put us in a good relationship. And if we denied that we had etty, that would also and did have etty and had etty and 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 put you know and scientifically experiment on it this would put us in a very bad set set up with them uh, but if we re return them in in whole or as uh, as whole as they landed and here is your fallen comrade um we would like to begin a discussion you know n now we're now we're talking well and and ultimately and this goes to our own growth and evolution as a species I think ultimately having a framework uh, for the preservation, you know, from morally, morally speaking, having a framework for the present preservation of, of bodies says as much about us as it does about ET. Right. And, and so there's that aspect of it as well. It's, it's, you know, it's being respectful and growing as a species. And so, you know, maybe that would convey that we are more mature. I guess as a species, than than simply it's difficult. Just... There, there are some religions who require, for complicated religious reasons, that their uh, that followers are either cremated or buried very quickly, um, and failure to do so would be in and of itself disrespectful. So, it is it's difficult to make the claim that doing nothing is the best way forwards. Because if you did nothing with with the body of one of the one of these religions, I think I think Islamic people, uh, Muslims, are required to be buried quite quickly um, mm, okay. after they've passed away. Uh, and if you don't do that, then that's that's a problem. Yeah, disrespectful. It's irreligious, and so on and so forth. So it is possible to claim that not doing anything, if you did nothing, you didn't bury it, or you didn't set fire to it, or you didn't. I don't. I don't know. Pick your pick your religious practice it is possible that doing nothing isn't of itself um disrespectful but i i suspect that being able to return in one piece uh a member of of the species to the species would be largely better than setting fire to it because um that might not be the right thing to do and it, it might be easier to say well we didn't know what to do so we did nothing um yeah that would be easier to say than well we didn't know what we'd do so we burned it um well and and it, I, it, I and that would be that would be synonymous with and again if you're using like et crashing on earth as an example if they crash in the desert nobody finds them nothing is done 
So if we do nothing, that would be similar to them not being found. So, so yeah, I, from that aspect of things, I guess that also seems like it would be the safest because, you know, presumably these creatures are out exploring the galaxy. And so who knows, maybe they crash all over the place, you know, and if that's the case, that this would just be yet another one, you know? Yeah. I, you know, I'm, and it's not that we wouldn't, humans and again i'm making that anthropocentric leap but doing so in a way which i i think is relevant to the discussion and in a safe way but if we traveled the stars uh in the way that sort of we're talking about here we would kind of expect to lose some people we yeah we did so in interstellar and it was uh it was a you know it was a tragedy it was it was sad it was clearly uh marked momentously that that people were lost in and the trying the resolution of that issue, but the trying to find another world to settle on. Um, but it's a different matter if if we then come across them later on, and know that they've been mauled or abused or experimented on. You know, I mean, if they were sat on a, I don't know, a makeshift gravesite or laid out nicely or moved separated from the spacecraft or something, uh, then we'd recognize that somebody had done something that they thought would be respectful respectful yeah yeah and and we would i would like to think we would be sort of a bit of bit uh generous in our interpretation of the actions but i mean if they're literally cut open and bits of them are hanging all over the place and torn apart or whatever you know you could assume an animal had been in there and eaten them or whatever and and the the uh, the response we have would be different um, but I think, you know, there was something you mentioned uh, only a minute ago about uh, the kinds of respect that's due. And I think I think what happens when we grow is that we have grown to become more morally attuned. So where yes. once slavery was de rigueur and where once racism was de rigueur and where uh, once sexism was de rigueur, we have overcome those we haven't but we're working on over we're working those, on it uh those uh those experiences and we are becoming quote unquote more moral now we we have no concept of alien morality there's no work done on it at all because it's also subjective and it's very difficult to understand what might there's a piece by scott backer i think um it, it's as close as it gets to any sort of a attempt to understand an alien morality even philosophy uh, so we have no concept, but, and you can't derive it. My previous work, as you know, was on axioms of, of first contact and you can't derive morality axiomatically. You can't get there by assuming sociality that something is moral. It's likely that there would be, but it, we can't assume it axiomatically. Um, and so what their, what their process of structuring their interactions is, is go also going to be unknown in the sense that it might be geared purely mathematically or purely utilitarianly, you know, in terms of the best outcome is the outcome that creates the least suffering or the, you know, I don't know, the most successful yield of whatever it is or the most success. I mean, who, who knows how these uh, entities even begin to, to characterize their decision protocol. Um, but it would be disrespectful to ourselves, to our own yes. morality, if yes. we acted poorly. And, and, and I think and, that's the point. Yes. And and the, the growth aspect of it are also when, when you mentioned that, you know, um, I mean, racism and gender inequality date back millennia, centuries, millennia. Right. I mean, it, you know, it, the, the slave trade dates back centuries. Absolutely. Racism and other things date back millennia. Uh, gender inequality goes back to probably the beginning of time. Um, uh, but, you know, in in the 1960s, we we saw people as as we grew and evolved, I think, as a species, as our morality grew, we saw people take a stand and say racism is not right. Segregation is not right. We're not going to tolerate it anymore. And I think that the uh, the sexual revolution, right, later again in the 1960s, but definitely in the 1970s, you know, and and then we start to saw we start to see the evolution of things like um, sexual harassment, which again dates back 
thousands and thousands of years. People were saying, this is not right. You know, women should have the same rights in the workplace that men have, and we're not going to tolerate this this kind of treatment anymore. Now, one of the things that for me was interesting was reading an article to take this even further, because I think that this is a spectrum of growth. Um, I'd read an interesting article about dogs, and they'd said in the 1980s, there was a quiet change in the way that we interact with dogs, where before, like it, when I was a kid, right, a lot of people would have what they call an outside dog or an inside dog, yeah, which yeah. comes out of our agrarian roots, right? Uh, agricultural, yeah. you know, where the, the dog lives in the garage, maybe it comes in for a pet, you know. Well, so dogs largely came indoors in the 1980s, and they became more a part of the family unit, and treatment of dogs became much better. So, you know, for me, that's that's really interesting because we're seeing this, again, this change and this growth of, of humanity. There's a, there are, I'm getting awfully philosophical here and I apologize to your viewers, but there, there are many ways to couch moral um, actions. We, we do, we call them moral theories and there are quite a few of them. Um, utilitarianism, deontology, uh, uh, pragmatic ethics there's a, there's, a, there's quite a few sort of archetypes of of how to determine moral behavior and there's much discussion about which one's right and which one's wrong uh and i'm not going to weigh in on on that argument that i'll i do engage yeah, these in are some giant of material, topics a, these yeah, are big topic. so one of the things that has come out recently is uh well not recently it's a sort of a uh revision of of old very old uh philosophic thinking which is that the way to act morally comes from within yeah and uh this was the uh, the the platonic sort of um moral theory and it and it basically states that uh you you when you are faced with a moral dilemma you look within yourself and somehow the correct moral answer sort of comes out. Um, I have to confess that I thought at the time when I learned about these things way back in my bachelor's and master's that they were, uh, this was a ridiculous idea. How could you look within and know what would be the, the right way to act? And curiously enough, about six months ago, I was headed to a conference and I had to drive all the way to Vancouver and I'd left Lethbridge late, and uh, it's quite a long drive. It's a 13-hour drive. And I, I'm driving, and I come to fuel up, and this one chap has sat at the fuel station in the middle of nowhere. And he's got a flat tire, and he doesn't have – he has a spare tire, but he has no jack or wheel brace. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I know, I know you drive a different car than me, but is there any chance you could – like, do you have a – could we try your wheel brace to see if it fits on and I'm like in my head I'm like no I don't have a half an hour to help you change the thing because I have to I have to be at the airport and my flight goes and if I'm not on it that's a big problem and so I I told him I said I'm sorry I'm in a bit of a rush and I don't have time and I filled the car up and I got in the car and I sat down and I looked in my rearview mirror and there was this youngish chap um uh who was sort of leaning on his car head in hands a bit sort of frustrated looking down the trying to see if there was anybody else on the highway and there wasn't and i thought to myself, i can't leave this guy here how can i leave this guy here what like what, what sort of a, what sort of a person am i that leaves this guy here yeah and that is the point that plato was talking about that kind of looking into yourself and saying this can't be the right way to do to to leave this guy um that is what it is to have that kind of moral uh, internal moral story and what you're talking about with the way that we've improved ourselves is this th this theory that i'm talking about has become more popular these days it's it's sort of grounding clinical ethics and hospital care and health care and other sorts of things and it's sort of had it's sort of returning to be a uh, uh, dominant way of deciding how to behave morally so it's become a more popular moral theory is what i'm trying to say and when i hear people say you know we, we we've looked back at the way that we behaved 
uh, when we did these things, when we were colonialists and when we did, you know, when we've, uh, when we focus on capitalism instead of, you know, all these other sorts of things and when we've focused on uh, mistreating, uh, you know, or not caring about it, missing indigenous peoples or, uh, you know, the quality of water on reservations or the, the uh, racist tendencies we have against people of color or all of the, whatever, pick your socially moral, um, you know, your moral social statement. Uh, what it is that we do is we sort of look in inwards in ourselves back at these historic actions and go, that was rubbish. We should not have done. How yeah. did we ever like, why did we think that was a good idea? Like, you know, and this is what we do, right? What, what guides the more moral, I think more morally responsible of us these days, not that I necessarily include myself with that played, but let's say that I do. What we do is we look back and we go, no, that was bad. That was bad because like, well, women not having equal jobs was bad. How could that women not having votes? Like, why, why was that a thing? Yeah, and we look back and we don't understand it. And that is our that's our shift to understand our moral obligation. That that's us and evolving. That's, that's us, us evolving. evolving. And that's what I think we need to, you know, this is what we need to do here is we need to instead of <laughs> instead of looking back at the time we cut open aliens and going, oh dear, that was a silly thing. How did we ever do that? Why what like who let that happen? Instead of saying that in 100 or 200 years time, why don't we look back and go, yeah, I'm really glad we didn't cut that alien open. That would have been a bad day. That was it showed moral. Yes. Yes. Well, and moral maturity. And, and and ultimately, one of the takeaways that I have from what you're saying is that respecting extraterrestrial life or respecting any kind of intelligent life comes back to ultimately respecting ourselves. Right. Yes, with the caveat that what we have historically done is we have we're consumers. We like humans. In in the past, we we've, we're really not a very nice species. We use and consume all of the things around us. You know, we yeah. we we use the rivers to dump our waste in, and we use uh, the forests and the trees to feed our insane demand for books and whatever and we use and houses and things and we use oil to make our computers go on our silly little plastic whatevers um we're a usury species and it's it's not a good i, I don't think that's a particularly good thing uh non non um non-sustainable usage at any rate and we can't let ourselves use an alien Etty to discover more about the universe. We can't do that. We we can we can use our telescopes and we can use our knowledge and we can use our thinking and we can use our technology to learn more and we can even use our technology to build ships that allows us to navigate in it. But you can't use it's wrong, and I say wrong in the moral sense. It's wrong yeah. to use an etty biological etty a fallen space. Um, extraterrestrial uh, to advance our knowledge even our knowledge of defense it's wrong because you are using something that has a, a respect in and of itself a val an intrinsic value in and of itself to further our gains I, I Kant would say that we're using it to service our own ends using another person to service our own ends and that is wrong even when they're dead, that is wrong. There's, we we get twitchy on Earth if there's a like a, we've heard it from time to time. There's a plane crash in the Alps, and and there's nine people, and they're not going to survive unless Buddy eats the other chap. Um, and mm. and we get all very twitchy about the fact that he was going to die, and they let him they let him die, but they cut him up after he died, and then eat him. And we get very upset about that, even though it protected. Uh, the lives of the other yes. people. We think it's awful to eat another human being, and it is. I guess I don't. I don't advocate it. But what I'm saying is that there's a, a, a nuance here, where it's it's not okay to eat a human being after they've died, uh, and it's not okay to to use an etty after they've died to understand more about the universe. It's not quite the same thing because cannibalism is. You know, we we have this weird sociological thing going on with it yes it's just it's it's the act of defilement that's bad yes uh, this the sustenance of the hu other human the maintenance of the other human being is good we like to perpetuate life and we certainly don't like to perpetuate life at the cost of another life if we can help it 
but then we have a problem if the dead if the person's dead anyway we still get a bit twitchy about eating them because we don't like the defilement and that's what i'm trying to get at we we don't like it for us why should we like it for other things and it would just be better if we didn't i think well steve on that note i think this has been an amazing discussion we have gone through so many different uh, moral and ethical implications and this is just really scratching the surface but again uh, it, so the paper itself if i understand correctly this is not in publication yet um but i can i can drop a link to it when you have it out right? yeah i should just i when i sent you the the brief the handout or whatever it is that i, I sent you I, I i should just mention that i entitled it um the right to and we didn't get a chance to talk about this it's such a rich field of, of of stuff there's so much to talk about but i entitled it the right to um uh, bodily and post posthumous bodily integrity of alien of eti biologics i'm not sure that the paper will end up making legal claims about you know what we might constitute rights sort of legally understood and the reason i say that is because there would probably need to be much more architecture for such a thing in in our legal framework which doesn't exist um and so you can't just slide the rights for extraterrestrial entities into our current political political and legal framework because it won't fit so i don't know that i'll be claiming any sort of legal rights but i will be claiming um the the claim in the paper will be about a moral sort of uh, respect that is due and what follows from that sort of moral respect, including this uh, and necessarily this, the protection of bodily integrity. Okay. Well, Steve, let me thank you so much for your time today, sir. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on again, Tim. It's been great.